Thanks very much to all of you for coming. Um, and thanks in particular to Professor Ingela Alger for delivering today's lecture. I'm delighted to have you. Um, so I'm Hilary Graves. I'm the director of the Global Priorities Institute here in Oxford. I'll just kick off by very briefly saying a little bit about GPI and then um, introduce our speaker. The Global Priorities Institute was established here in Oxford in 2018. Our mission, if you like, is to produce and to facilitate that others produce research that's especially crucial for agents who are completely impartial and who are trying to do the most possible good, subject to the fixed resources they have under their control. Um, so our question is, if, you, if you've got some lot of, let's say, money, or it could be time, and you want to deploy it in such a way as to do the most possible good, in a sense that's completely impartial between everything that is appropriate to be impartial between, so time, species, people, geographical regions, um, you name it, um, then what's the best way of doing that? So this project is, of course, in principle, um, an extremely big question, but the reason GPI exists is that we think, despite the scale of that question, the number of issues it raises, there are ways you can make real progress on it by carefully deploying the tools of various academic disciplines. And here at GPI, we focus in particular, for the moment at least, on economics and philosophy, the two disciplines in which we have teams. Um, at GPI, we have a particular focus on the further future, so we're, we're especially interested in the question of whether there are sufficiently tractable ways of influencing, nudging the course of the very far future in positive directions. So we want to know what are the main challenges to doing that thing, what research would help to evaluate those challenges and help us to decide whether it's even worth trying to do that thing or whether it's too intractable. And insofar as one is trying to influence the course of the very far future, what research would help guide one in one's attempt to do that. So this leads to other things to the purpose of the lecture series that brings us here today. The series is named in honour of Professor Sir Tony Atkinson, who, as most people here I imagine will know, was a towering figure both here in Oxford and internationally. Atkinson's work focused in particular um, on the notion of inequality and also more generally um, on issues to do with increasing welfare. So we're very honoured to be able to host this distinguished lecture series in his name, and we're very happy to be back here in person for the first time since 2019 for the lecture. On a quick logistical note, this lecture is going to run for one hour, and there'll be 25 minutes of Q&A at the end. Please confine any questions during the talk um, to essential clarifications and reserve substantive things for the end. Please be aware that the talk will be recorded for posting online. So, among other things, if you do raise a question during the lecture itself, that will be part of the online recording. Um, okay, so without further ado then, let me introduce today's speaker. Oh, sorry, so for the people who are online, um, there is a link that you can use to raise your questions at the end, if, or alternatively you can use the raise hand function. Um, you can also use the raise hand function to indicate that you'd like to ask a clarification during the talk. Did I get that right? Sorry, no. So on, uh, online, Russell will you tell you what to do. <laughs> online, you have to submit questions using a link, and if you're in the audience here, you can use that link as well, if you prefer to type a question. And then I will read out the question at the end. And if you just want to ask a question in a regular way, just put your hand up if you're in a room. Thanks. Sorry. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so without further ado then, um, Ingela Alger is a CNRS, Senior Researcher in Economics at Toulouse School of Economics. She's a CEPR Research Fellow. She's also the Director of the Institute for Advanced Study in Toulouse, that's the IAST. Um, and this year she received the CNRS Solar Medal, which is awarded to a small number of distinguished scientific researchers in France. Her research focuses on the long-run formation of human preferences, in particular when these are transmitted for gener from generation to generation and are subject to selection. She's particularly interested in preferences that might explain moral and altruistic behaviours, as well as behaviours within the family and topics that she'll touch on in her talk today. So Ingela is going to be presenting on the evolutionary foundations of morality and altruism, recent advances. I'll hand you over to us. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, thank you so much for the, for the invitation uh, to, to, to GPI for Oxford. Uh, it's a pleasure to discover uh, what GPI is about. I mean, I think it's a young institute, but I've already heard of, uh, of it several years ago. So it's you know, a big splash already. And I think this combination of economics and philosophy is yeah. very, very interesting. So at IEST, just to, to tell you a few words about that, it's also an interdisciplinary research institute. And I think that, that uh, indeed many of the uh, important questions today require an interdisciplinary approach. And uh, so I look forward to future interactions, perhaps also with humanities and, and researchers like that at, uh, at GPI. 
especially because we do not, do not have a lot of philosophers coming our way. So there are some things we trade perhaps in terms of um, so oops. Yes, so Tony Atkinson, uh, this is I think the post I, I got to him, uh, actually it was that um, uh, I was giving a talk at the World Bank um, a day before that. Tony Atkinson was talking, um, tackling the challenges of the 21st century uh, remotely, however, and, uh, and then uh, suddenly passed away a year, a year later. So, of course, yes, so I'm extremely uh, honored and, and uh, um, yes. Sorry, can you have to speak a little bit louder? Yes, I'll try. Okay. So, it's very humbling to, to be speaking uh, uh, in honor of his family. So, um, into the talk. So, what uh, economists are essentially in the business of formulating uh, policy recommendations. Right. So, and what is the goal of these policy recommendations? The goal is simply to try a way to, 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 to maximize human welfare, or given uh, given some constraints, given the uh, available resources. Now, of course, if you ask a man in the street about you know how should we proceed if we want to achieve this goal, it's an extremely daunting task, right? Where do you even begin thinking about this, answering this question? And uh, so, fortunately, in economics, we have a very powerful set of uh, uh, results and a powerful um, paradigm to stand on to, to try to answer, to bring answer to this question. As we know, uh, in the 1950s, from the 1950s, we have the first welfare theorem, which uh, states uh, sufficient conditions for a decentralized market to bring about a, an equilibrium outcome that is uh, efficient, right? So if markets are complete, if there is perfect information, perfect competition, and if information is complete, then any market equilibrium is pretty efficient. Right, and so standing on this benchmark, then uh, for the next few decades, economists got very busy trying to uh, understand how or which kind of inefficiencies would arise if these assumptions were not uh, satisfied, right? So, in these decades, we saw um, many, many, many policy recommendations. Uh, so, recommendations uh, on policies that seek to mitigate inefficiencies that stem from uh, incomplete markets, market power, and or information asymmetries and imperfections. Fine. However, if we uh, so one remarkable uh, feature of the first fundamental welfare theorem is, of course, that uh, individuals need not want to achieve the greater good. It is achieved even if uh, individuals are perfectly materially self-interested. This goes back to uh, the famous butcher, brewer, and baker sentence of Adam Smith. However, we also know that Adam Smith before he wrote The Wealth of Nations, uh, wrote the theory of moral sentiments, and it's clear that he did not, he did not believe that, that individuals are always purely selfish. However, he realized that was sufficient to bring about efficiency, and he had his intuition, and which, which was formalized in the 1950s. Right, so he understood that human nature is much more complex than selfishness, and this was also true uh, uh, for many uh, scholars in the 19th century, early 20th century. However, in formulating the first welfare theorem, the complexity of human behavior was somehow pushed to the background. And so to some extent, I think that we should think of the first welfare theorem as having this fourth condition, which is that individuals care only to some extent, only about their uh, consumption, utility, and utility from leisure activities. Um, however, and so this led uh, economists to formulate policy recommendations that were mostly based on material incentives, right? If individuals care only about 
um, maximizing income and maximizing the consumption utility derived from income, the material incentives seem to be uh, sufficient and perhaps also necessary to induce um, correcting behaviors. But if we really want to have a sense of what are desirable policies, so we want to reach the goal of, of maximizing human welfare, and if we want to identify policies that are effective, not backfiring, for example, then we need to have an accurate account of human behavior. And uh, as we know, as you probably know, right in the past 20, 25, 30 years or so, there has been a, a, lot, a large number of alternative uh, goals of humans that have been analyzed, proposed. So going from uh, altruism, on like Gary Becker, or Wonglow, proposed by Jim Andrioni, and so forth. We have a long, long list, a menu, of such alternative preferences that can generate either uh, pro-social behaviors or conformity, and, and so forth. So many of these theories were inspired either by uh, from psychology or sociology. Uh, a lot of experimental evidence has been uh, built to test, uh, test some of these theories. However, uh, I think it's fair to say that there is not yet a consensus of what a policymaker should expect. You know, if, a policymaker were, if, if an economist were to make a re policy recommendation and also state, okay, you can, you, I recommend this policy because the distribution of preference in the population that you're, uh, that you're uh, governing is, is, is this distribution. But I, I don't think that there is, there is a consensus on what that, uh, the distributions would be and how we would actually be able even to accurately measure them. So uh, in, uh, what I'm going to talk about here is that we are seeking to go one step beyond this literature by asking which preferences should we expect from first principles. And so ideally what we want is that such a theory should shed light on which preferences are more plausible than others. So we can try to sort of narrow the set of hypotheses that we think are, are plausible. And uh, ideally we should also be able to understand, it should help us understand why we should expect this or that preference. So the mechanisms um, behind this. Okay, so uh, long-termism at GPI, we've heard about. So uh, instead of looking forward, however, here I'm going to take a you know a peek uh, backwards in time and maybe potentially several million years. Um, right. So Homo sapiens is. Um, where we are now, and who knows what the future uh, the future uh, is uh, reserving for us? But um, we are standing on, let's say, the uh, shoulders of many, many millions of, of ancestors, and so uh, this is the this is a fact, right? And uh, so, what can we uh, say about how this evolutionary history how has it shaped us, and what does it mean? For so we're going to use evolutionary logic to formulate this theory of an endogenous uh, preference formation. So what is evolution? It's simply competition for survival and for reproduction, right? So not all individuals who are born survive, and not all who survive and reproduce. And so the Darwinian logic is very simple, and it's implacable. Those alive today we have all ancestors who were successful at surviving and reproducing. It's kind of mind-boggling, right? We have, each of us, we have like billions of ancestors if we go far back. You know. So our preferences should reflect this. And so we're going to use this uh, simple logic to develop a theory for the evolutionary foundations of preferences. And in particular, preferences that are relevant for economic policy. Okay, so according to evolutionary theory, then uh, reproductive success is the name of the game. Okay, so 
for them? Shouldn't the, shouldn't it simply be the the, the, the fact that uh, humans should be expected to be equipped with traits that make them maximize own reproductive success? That would seem to be a perfectly logical uh, statement, right? So, end of story. Well, okay, so that's the main theoretical challenge of this literature, is to answer this question. Is it the case that evolutionary logic should lead us to simply seek to maximize own reproductive success? Or is it something more compli complicated? And understand the mechanism for why we should expect preferences to be like this or not like this. Okay? So, roadmap for the talk. I'm first going to spend a couple of slides um, describing the general framework that we use in this literature. And then I want to talk about two uh, insights and the implications of these. If I have time, also a third insight, and then conclude. All right, so the framework is based on simple uh, evolutionary logic that we, we take the analysis of the level of the population. There is a process of a mutation and selection going on in this population. So think of there being a sequence of generations. In each generation, there is a certain distribution of preferences. There may also be sometimes novel or mutant preferences that enter into the population. Then individuals are somehow matched to interact with each other. Each individual's preferences guides his or her behavior according to standard economic theory. The uh, equilibrium or the uh, uh, behaviors result in equilibrium material payoffs. And these material payoffs in turn will determine the reproductive success. And those with a high reproductive success will have offspring. And so the differential reproductive success then determines the distribution of preference in the next generation, and so forth, right? So think of this as a wheel, you turn it enough, you throw in some mutants sometimes, and then you see if there is some preference that actually withstands the invasion of these mutants, and that, that is then what we will call evolutionarily stable. All right, so I would like to just to note here that uh, I think so that these mathematical models that we use are silent as to whether the transmission of traits from one generation to the next is uh, biological or cultural. Okay. So there's no there's no um, oops there is no assumption there. There is no assumption there that these traits need to be uh, biologically uh, coded. Could be, not necessarily. So. Yeah. Continuing on the general framework, the go uh, first goal with uh, these uh, these models will be to determine which preferences this process of mutation and selection leads to. And here I'm citing some seminal uh, papers in this literature. The second goal will be to understand how features in the environment in which the population evolves affects the evolutionary viability of preferences. And so there are many more modeling choices to be made. Uh, for example, how are individuals matched to interact? Uh, under what informational, uh, what is the informational context? Can they observe each other's preferences or not? Uh, and what is a set of potential preferences? Right, so you will see a, a couple of variations on, on these assumptions. Okay, so insight number one. Evolution by natural selection may favor weaker intrafamily ties, uh, intrafamily altruism in harsher environments. Okay, so this is based on uh, work with uh, Jürgen Babel, who has been my co-author on essentially all, all this work. And so here we're going to look at interactions uh, within, within the families, between members of the same family. And because members of the same family, they have the opportunity to observe each other over long periods of time, 
it's then reasonable to think that those interactions take place under concrete information. They, they know each other pretty well. They can uh, uh, foresee what the, uh, the others will, will do. And so here in, in this work, we also take as a given the fact that uh, individuals are equipped with preferences whereby they attach some positive weight to the uh, other family members' reproductive success. So W here, here is a um, notation for reproductive success. And so here, um, utility of an individual with degree of altruism alpha uh, attaches a weight one to own reproductive success given the behavior strategy X played by self, and given that the uh, other family member plays strategy Y, and then this weight alpha to the other family member's reproductive success who plays Y when self plays X, right? So this is the, here, in this paper, the, the set of potential preferences is going to be uh, this interval minus 1, 1. Okay, we're going to look for evolutionarily stable values of alpha. Um, setting this paper here, which is also sort of a canonical paper on, on more generally, on a preference evolution when interactions take place on the complete information. Okay. And in the um, 2010 paper that I cited, we have um, the following interaction that we analyze. So we have, I think, of a pair of siblings. They, uh, simultaneously choose productive efforts. Maybe this is, think of an agricultural society, so in the spring they sow and so forth, and they, they, they do what they need to, be, to, to do on, on the farm. Then they choose a level of productive efforts. Then um, summer arrives, and each sibling stays, so they have, think of them as grown-up siblings that have, uh, they each have their uh, own farm. And an output is realized. This is random, so there will be weather shocks, but also the probability that a high output occurs depends also on the level of effort that the individual uh, exerted. Okay, and then they actually observe each other's outputs, and they may choose to make a transfer to the other or not. All right, and then uh, this uh, the amount of food they have and so forth then gives rise to a potentially differential, fertility differential of reproductive success. Okay? Right. And these decisions will then be taken given the altruistic preferences that they have, right? And in particular, the altruism will lead to lower or higher transfers. The higher is the altruism, the higher is the transfer from a rich sibling to a poor sibling. And uh, this also comes into play when they choose the pro productive efforts. They can foresee how much they will help each other out. And they also, uh, the more altruistic uh, an individual is, the more he or she will be happy to help out the sibling and also to, be, uh, to, to feel sorry for the sibling when the sibling has to help him or her out. Okay, so all that this comes into play and we can figure out what the equilibrium efforts and transfers are for uh, given uh, levels of altruism, and we can then use this to determine what are evolutionarily stable degrees of altruism. So I'm going to show you, I'm going to directly go to the evolutionarily stable degrees of altruism, and I'm going to show you how these depend on uh, the environment in which this population evolves. And I'm going to have two parameters that measure the environment. One is lambda. Lambda is here the ratio of the low to the high output. So you can think of this as measuring output variability. Think of YH as being uh, well, nice, red, juicy tomatoes. Okay, you can grow such tomatoes in uh, various environments. However, in some environments, it's harder to get them. And, and if you fail, it will fail uh, a lot. Whereas in other environments, the uh, outcome of those tomato plants is less, less, uh, less sensitive. The second parameter is theta, which uh, is, so x here is stands for effort, and theta is the marginal return to effort. So you can think of this theta as the highest theta 
with fewer calories you need to put in to produce more calories. So lambda theta is the this set pair of parameters is the environment. And I would say that an environment, uh, lambda prime, theta prime, is harsher than some other environment. If the, either the output variability is more pronounced, so that if you fail, uh, the, the consequences are, are, are dire. And, uh, and also the marginal return to effort is smaller. Okay, so you need to work harder to produce the same output. Okay. And so here we, we see a picture that shows as a function of the environment. So here we have the lambda. So lower lambda is a harsher environment. And theta, the marginal return to effort. So again, theta, lower theta is a harsher environment. Okay. And so on the vertical axis, we see here it's the uh, value of the evolutionarily stable uh, degree of altruism. So in, let's say, these generous environments over here, we get an alpha which is close to 0.5. And this is what we sh actually would have expected from evolutionary biology, because uh, siblings are uh, related uh, by a factor of one half. Okay, so um, uh, essentially, uh, uh, if 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 you're if you're a carrier of some rare gene in the population, then the probability that your sibling also carries that those rare genes is one half. So evolutionary biology tells us by Hamilton's rule that you may have heard of that we should expect alpha to be around one half. However, now that we have this effect of altruism on production levels as well, we actually get this other effect, which takes the degree of altruism down way below 0.5 in certain environments. So here, in this very harsh environment, it's only about 0.2. Okay, so uh, there's a stark, stark difference there. So what this says, right, is that we may expect family, uh, intra-family altruism to, to vary with the environment. And in, in this uh, model, it is uh, the, the uh, intra-family altruism is lower in harsher environments. So uh, you may have heard of Sweden Gate. Have you heard of Sweden Gate? No? So it's recently this whole thing on social media that Swedes are not generous towards strangers. They don't invite them to, uh, to eat. However, I say that you shouldn't worry if you're a stranger, because in Sweden, we would not necessarily even invite the brother to the team. So, <laughs> <laughs> don't treat you differently. Okay. Right. So in sum, what do we get from this analysis? For pre-industrial times, in agricultural societies, our model predicts weaker altruism in harsher climates. So I could say that this is actually in line with the notion that uh, individualism uh, rose in Northwestern Europe um, prior to uh, elsewhere. And this is also what Max Weber, uh, what is in line also with the statement by Max Weber that you can find in the religion of China. He says, so you all know about Max Weber's Protestant ethic, work ethic. However, here's another statement. The great achievement of Protestantism was to shatter the fetters of the sin. These religions established a common ethical way of life in opposition to the community of blood, even to a large extent in opposition to the family. So I'd say this prediction is kind of in line with, with the idea that in parts of the world where Protestant, Protestantism was readily adopted, that is, Northwestern Europe, uh, we had uh, um, this weaker, weaker family. So more generally, what this model says is that it predicts that the strength of family ties uh, uh, depends on the environment. And uh, I suppose that maybe this is a bit provocative, but uh, I'd like to, to raise a question that, uh, well, what does this say about the relevance of the economics model of individual utility maximization, how relevant is that for parts of the world where we may expect 
family ties, intrafamilial relationships to, to be extremely strong. And I think it also raises the questions for economic uh, for, uh, for economic development. It's a chicken and egg question. Sometimes we hear that in developing countries, uh, informal risk sharing uh, is there because there are no formal markets, no formal insurance markets. However, you could also uh, think that uh, it could have been, you know, the, the lack of formal insurance markets may be due to uh, extensive intra-family resource sharing that that actually lowers the demand for um, for formal insurance. Okay. On now to uh, insight number two. So, evolution by natural selection favors a concern for universalization or a form of Kantian morality. So here, I'm going to turn to interactions between strangers. And so, uh, for interactions beyond the family, it's um, it's question, questionable to assume that we have uh, that we observe each other's preferences. So here, we're going to take uh, adopt a model in which interactions take place under incomplete information. So each individual knows his or her preferences, but not those of the, uh, the those with whom uh, they interact. And you remember this question, right? We need to always um, figure out what is a set of potential preferences. So in this work, we are going to uh, take um, a minimalistic approach by saying that, well, a utility function could be any function over the do where the domain of the function is the set of strategy profiles. That is, preferences only need to uh, describe the preferences of the so with the strategies played by self and the other. For technical reasons, it we restrict attention to continuous utility functions. But the approach is, it could be anything, essentially. And so this is based on a work, uh, again, with Jürgen. And here I'm mentioning these papers that also uh, have uh, quite general models of this kind of interaction. However, the way uh, it differs is that we allow for um, another kind of matching process between interacting individuals. And this is what leads to uh, this Kantian, uh, Kantian morality that uh, they could not uh, see in their model. So uh, before I state the result, um, let me define what homo moralis is. So an individual is a homo moralis with a degree of morality, kappa, which is a number between zero and one, if her utility function is of this form. So here you recognize again the first term is the uh, individual's own reproductive success when playing strategy X when the other plays Y. Now here this is different from altruism. Here we no longer have the actual reproductive success of the other. Instead, it is the reproductive success that the individual herself would obtain if her strategy X was universalized, so that the other also would play this hypothetically. Okay, and I'm going to show the results that point strongly towards this utility function as being favored by evolution by natural selection. And uh, so why do we call this morality, Kant and moral concern, right? So uh, Kant, according to Kant, right, they said, act only according to that maxim where you be, whereby you can will that it should become a universal law. Now, if we look at this function here, we can think of it as saying, act according to that maxim whereby you can will that others should do likewise with probability kappa. So it's a partial accounting concern when kappa is below one. But you get the full accounting concern when kappa is equal. Ah. The computer is doing some noise. Yeah, just a 
Now it works. Okay. And so here is the, um, the, the result. The first part says that this kind of preferences for Homo moralis with a specific degree of morality, kappa equal to a number r, which I will tell you more about in a second, is evolutionarily stable against any preference type that is behaviorally distinguishable from such homomorphs. And we have almost an infinity of statement. The second part is any type which is behaviorally distinguishable from homomorphs with this particular value of kappa is evolutionarily unstable, that is, would be displaced by some mutant utility function that comes into the population. Okay, what is R? So R is the coefficient of relatedness, um, which is a term that goes back to biologists who are right, 1931. The coefficient of relatedness is essentially the probability that the interactants have a common ancestor not too far back in time. And so this can be calculated, but here we just take um, sort of a reduced form approach and, uh, and uh, look at this as the mutants are extremely rare. So some intuition for why this result obtains. The homo moralis uh, preempt entry by mutants. And how does that so? Um, because indeed, um, we, um, you know, this baseline intuition that if evolution is all about reproductive success, we should be expected to simply uh, maximize reproductive success. We should expect to see only this term here. Right? Well, that's not the case. So, how how can uh, this utility function um, leads to behaviors that preempt entry by mutants. The intuition is that uh, homo moralis with uh, this special degree of specific degree of morality, kappa equal to r, will play a strategy that uh, solves this fixed point problem. So they play Nash equilibrium is the best response to itself according to these preferences. Fine. Okay, now take a, a rare mutant coming into this population with some other preferences and that are behaviorally distinguishable from homo moralis. Such a mutant would play some strategy, that's what it said, and remember that this R here is the probability that a rare mutant is uh, going to interact with another rare mutant. So here we have the term that corresponds to uh, when this happens. So a rare mutant playing Z with probability R is matched with another mutant also playing Z. However, with probability 1 minus R, the rare mutant is matched with uh, the homo moralis who is playing this strategy, uh, this strategy here. And so we see here that the rare mutant gets on average this reproductive success, but the homo moralis is already playing that strategy that maximizes the, uh, uh, the reproductive success of a rare mutant. So, it leads us to this, this very strong result. Okay, so where does this positive coefficient of relatedness R come from? It comes from, uh, so, as I said, so it's the tendency for individuals sharing a common ancestor to interact. And this happens uh, in populations where, uh, let's say, you're structured into groups, or at least there is some limited migration between groups. So you're born in a place, and uh, then you will, uh, among your neighbors, you will find people who were also born in the same place, or whose ancestor immigrated, who were. Uh, or, um, yes, sorry. And so this corresponds exactly to uh, the, our uh, evolutionary past, right? So there is evidence that for, let's say, the last couple of million years or so, 
uh, our ancestors lived in small groups of between 5 to 150 grown-ups. They expanded beyond the nuclear family and that uh, clearly there was a limited migration between, uh, between these groups. There was some migration, but not fully. The, the population was not fully remixing uh, in each uh, time period. So this kind of uh, population structure is part of the environment of evolutionary adaptiveness uh, of uh, the human lineage. So I think it's fair to, uh, safe to say that uh, this R is not equal to zero, was not equal to zero uh, for most of our, our um, uh, past. So we should expect, according to this theory, that behavior should have been in line with this, with this uh, homo moralis, with a certain morality R. Now, what are uh, some implications of, of these preferences? So I'm going to show you a couple of simple interactions and just to highlight some key differences between altruism on the one hand and these homo moralis preferences on the other hand. So here I have a prisoner's dilemma. And uh, if we start by Homo economicus, we know that uh, defect defect is the unique Nash equilibrium. If we take now altruists, then an altruist can take into account the negative impact or positive impact on the other. And so for a degree of altruism high enough, then uh, the unique equilibrium will be a uh, cooperate cooperate. The same is true for uh, individuals who are homomoralists. If their degree of morality is high enough, then the unique equilibrium is also a uh, cooperate cooperate. So here there's not a no distinction. I mean, both altruism and morality give rise to pro-social uh, behavior. But now let's look at coordination game, right? So coordination games are everywhere in life. And um, so here the G and B here stands for the good and the bad equilibrium, right? So home economicus, for home economicus, both GG and BB are national equilibrium. Let's look at altruists. Well, the same is true for altruists. Both GG and BB are equilibrium, right? If I'm very altruistic and I expect the opponent to play B, then I will also play B. I will even have a stronger incentive to play B than in home economicus because I will care about the negative externality that I would uh, exert on my opponent if I were to switch to, to G. Okay, here's where the difference is with homo moralis because homo moralis is kind of selfish, does not care about the negative externality per se, but instead evaluates the strategies according to what material payoff would be if behavior strategy was universalized. So, for kappa high enough, the bad equilibrium is uh, is um, no longer an equilibrium. So, GG is the unique natural equilibrium for kappa high enough. So, here morality also acts like an uh, equilibrium selection mechanism. Okay. If we think about public good settings where each individual's real impact is negligible, I to think of climate change, think pollution, think voting, then uh, Homo economicus will not contribute or vote, right, if it's costly. Altruists, neither. Altruists, uh, even if they care a lot about others, if their impact is, is essentially nil, they will do nothing either. Homo moralis would be very different because uh, because Homo um, moralis evaluates what the what the outcome would be if the behavior was universalized. So Homo um, moralis acts as if he or she had weight in the population in the outcome, uh, although this is not the case. Right? So he or she would be perfectly conscious about the fact that there is no real impact, but would nonetheless act as if there was a real impact. Okay, so um, these, this preference class is novel to economics, so uh, recently there have been uh, quite a few uh, uh, papers on this. However, I think uh, we still need to understand better how what these homo moralis preferences actually imply for uh, standard, standard models. Okay, so I think I do have time. I'll go to insight number three. 
and uh, which will actually, uh, so the Homo moralis result uh, is, uh, perhaps gives us, let's say, hope for, for uh, human nature that we can, uh, maybe, if, maybe we have this latent kappa, maybe latent to high kappa somewhere if we, um, uh, if we can uh, awaken it. However, uh, this third insight would set us back a little bit. Why? Because uh, we will uh, we have been able to work out a, an even more detailed uh, model, which leads us to uh, the following prediction that evolution by natural selection does indeed favor the Kantian moral concern at the level of, of reproductive success, but at the level of material payoffs, which is what social scientists mostly observe, then we should be expected instead to see a mix of Kantian moral concern and some other regarding concern, which could be altruism or spite. So what this work does is, it's so far I have only talked about reproductive, reproductive success. I have not really talked about material payoffs, you know, trivial, trivial material payoffs that we see in everyday life. So in this work, together with Jürgen Weigel again, and also with Laurent Lehmann, who is an evolutionary biologist in, in Lausanne, we have worked on disentangling these two. Okay, so we still have the reproductive success. But now we also have explicitly the material payoff, trivial material payoffs in everyday life. And so here is, is, is so it's a more complex model. Don't worry about the math here. What this theorem says essentially is that we confirm what we found before, namely that at the level of reproductive success, it is still homo moralis that, that rules. Right? So we have this term again, relatedness times reproductive success if own behavior was universalized. Okay, so do not kill your neighbor. That's perfectly you know, easy to explain with this, this kind of utility function. However, if we now look at trivial material payoffs, so what biologists call weak selection, where material payoffs uh, affect reproductive success only marginally, then we uh, have the following result, which says that uh, under weak selection, the following, this utility function is uninvadable or evolutionarily stable, and here pi stands for these material payoffs. Now we have a more complex function. It's not so important that we have these four terms, but what is important is to realize that there is now a novel term Right, compared to uh, what we have when we uh, look at preferences at the level of material uh, of reproductive success, here we now see the pi xj xi appear, which is what that is the material payoff of the other uh, other individual. So we still have so I would care about over material payoff. I care about what my material payoff would be if my behavior was universalized, but I would now also care about the opponent's actual material payoff. And depending on the sign of this um, variable lambda, either I, I would uh, exhibit uh, spite or I would be willing to incur a cost to lower, to lower the other's material payoff. Or uh, lambda could be negative, in which case I would be also, on top of being count and moral, I would also be altruistic. And this comes from um, the local competition, or rather the, uh, the, the, the gains in reproductive success that can be obtained by lowering or increasing the material payoffs of my neighbors. Sorry. Oh. Okay, so yeah, coming to the concluding uh, remarks here. So theory can help us understand how evolutionary forces may have shaped 
our practices. <coughs> and we can also, we can, this theory can help us understand how the environment has affected our preferences. And in particular, it can help us understand the var variation of preferences across the world, potentially. And it can also uh, lead us to discover novel preference classes. And uh, to come back to, to um, the, uh, the introduction, you know, if we think again about so what are the implications right, for this uh, for, for policy recommendations, well, uh, hopefully they can be a complement to behavioral economics and to um, insights from other disciplines as well about human nature and to um, the empirical work that we have from there. It can be a, a valuable complement because it allows us to uh, enlarge the set of potential um, motivations. And it can also help us explain and get testable predictions <coughs> on how we should expect uh, potential cultures or preferences to vary across different parts of the world. And, uh, but of course, to formulate desirable and effective uh, policy recommendations, um, we, we need also to do uh, work now to assess the theoretical implications of these novel uh, preferences and also to assess the empirical relevance to try to get a, a, a sense of what the distribution of preferences uh, are. And so there is some initial uh, experimental work on this, um, but um, so we're far from, from understanding the full implications of, of these, these results. And um, just to make a, a few recent surveys, if you're interested in, in, uh, in this work, I would also like to mention um, uh, John Newton's uh, recent survey on evolution of game theory, as well as uh, very interesting work by Arthur Robson on preference evolution in decision problems that do not involve strategic interactions. Okay, so. Thanks to uh, my co-authors on these on these uh, papers, without whom uh, this uh, work certainly never would have uh, uh, occurred. And I should mention that in the one man, the evolutionary biologist, we uh, really got to interact with him thanks to the um, the IST teams, which is um, another home for for interdisciplinary um, dialogue. And yes, thanks to of course, funders and inspiration from 19th century. <laughs> Thank you.